co-chairing with me is Dr. Mitzi Osabel, uh, all the way from Tampu City. So we are, our, our topic is on the antimicrobial uh, resistance and antimicrobial stewardship. But we have a bonus topic. Uh, it was actually a topic last night, but um, we think it's a very important topic to discuss, which is uh, uh, TB notification. So let me introduce our speaker. Can we show the CV? May we have the CV of our speakers? Okay, our first speaker is Dr. Brian Albert Lim. He is a diplomate of the PSMID, Fellow of the Philippine College of Physicians. He is ongoing his Master's in Development <coughs> Economics in UP Diliman. He is one of the young physician leaders of the Inter Academy Medical Panel, an alumnus of the Global Shapers World Economic Forum, and alumnus of Asia 21 Young Leaders Initiative. He will be talking about uh, the economic challenges in setting up and sustaining an AMR AMS system in the hospital. So I'm sure all of you can relate, so try to listen very carefully to this lecture. And then our next speaker is Dr. Carl Evans Henson. He's like a Balikbayan fellow. <laughs> a Balikbayan IBS. He's a clinical associate professor at the UP College of Medicine, section of infectious diseases, an infectious disease consultant of the medical city. And he's the director of the Hospital Infection Control and Epidemiology Center at the Medical City and the chair of the Antimicrobial Stewardship Committee in the Medical City. I said Balik Bayan because he had his fellowship in the U.S. So he did mention it And our third uh, speaker is um, Dr. Janice Kawini. Her topic is on the mandatory TB notification. She is the chief of the section of infectious diseases, Department of Medicine at the Makati Medical, Medical Center, the head of the Infection Prevention and Control Department of the Makati Medical Center, head of Center for Travel and Tropical Medicine, HIV Treatment Hub of Makati Medical Center, and the Assistant Secretary of the PSMI. Okay, so let's start the ball rolling. We'll, we'll call first our first speaker, Dr. Brian Lee. Let's give him a big hand. A very good morning to everyone. Um, thank you, PSMID, for giving me this opportunity to share the findings, some of the findings of our research entitled The Epidemiology, the Epidemiology and Burden of Disease of Infections Due to extend, Extended Spectrum Vector Lactamies Producing Organisms and medicinal resistant staphylococcus aureus of patients admitted in Sentinel Hospitals of the Antimicrobial Resistance Surveillance Program of the Philippines Department of Health. I would like to personally thank uh, and acknowledge the callers who are here, Dr. JC Valencia, Dr. Enifor Chin from RITM, Carl Fernandez from NKTI, Eileen Lee from UST, and Charles from Rivera from RMC. And of course, our supervising uh, investigators, Dr. Alejandria and Dr. Mendoza. So as you can see, this is a product of the blood, sweat, tears of fellows of different institutions. So one of the major challenges when we in establishing AMR and AMS uh, in our hospitals is truly convincing administrations of the cost, convincing them that it's cost-effective to actually invest in infection control. So hopefully, as we go through the slides, you can have an appreciation of how much it, it really is costing uh, our patients. And if you are in government hospitals, how much it is costing the government. So antimicrobial resistance is a rising global threat. According to the report of the World Organization, in 2014, the United States and the European Union had 25,000 deaths. 
and 2.5 million extra hospital days attributable to antimicrobial resistant organisms. It is estimated that the annual cost of AMR in the United States is at 21 to 34 billion dollars. In the Philippines, pathogens causing common infections have already been documented to acquire antimicrobial resistance. In 2016, the ESBL rates was 27% for E. coli and 30% for Capsella pneumonia. Also, as can be seen in the graph, which shows that yearly penicillin oxazolin and vancomycin resistance rates of Staphylococcus aureus is also rising. However, local data regarding the economic burden of infections due to these antimicrobial resistant organisms is limited. Metrics used to quantify the burden, such as cost, mortality, disability adjusted life years, length of stay in the hospital, and cost of care, are difficult to extrapolate from isolated resistance rates alone. There is a need, therefore, to evaluate the burden of disease caused by drug resistant microbes in order to design cost effective measures to address the threat of AMR. So, again, this is just the first step. So, the main objective of this study. It aims to estimate the cost of treating infections attributable to ESBL producing E. coli and Krebsella, as well as methicillin resistant Staphylococcus aureus in selected ARSP hospitals. So, specifically, among infections due to MRSA and ESBL, Krebsella, and E. coli in selected ARSP hospitals, we aim to determine the epidemiologic parameters of clinically the prevalence of clinically significant MRSA and ESBL infections. This is quite significant because the isolates that uh, are submitted to ARSP, some of them may not be clinically significant. Prevalence of attributable sequelae, the morbidity, and overall and attributable mortality rates. And to describe the patients according to the following clinical profile. Next is to do a cost analysis of clinically significant MRSA and ESBL producing KPN and E. coli infections. And to compare the mentioned epidemiologic and economic parameters between lower respiratory tract infections due to the resistant and non-resistant organisms, urinary tract infections of ESBL and non-ESBL E. coli, and bloodstream and soft tissue for staphylococcus. So this is a one-year retrospective study. So we have 22 sentinel sites of ARSP, but this being the pilot, we surveyed the, the following NCR hospitals, PGH, NPTI, USC, RMC, and RITM. So we have a good mix of private, public, and semi-private as well. So our sampling frame uh, is a list of uh, Klebsiella, E. coli, and Staphylococcus aureus isolates submitted in the ARSP last 2015. In. We assume that 70 percent of the staph aureus resulted to clinically significant infections, while 50 percent for Klebsiella and E. coli. This became the basis of our sample size. Based on these assumptions, systematic sampling was conducted in proportional sampling amongst the different ARSP hospitals. So the total sample size is 787. So for the study procedure, first the 2015 data sets from the lab databases was retrieved. The datasets were manually checked for entry for errors such as duplication of specimens, incomplete data and unclear isolated susceptibilities. Inconsistencies in incomplete data were verified in actual printed reports and logbooks. For duplications, we obtained the first isolate as recommended by the ARSP protocol. A list fulfilling the inclusion criteria were created and nothing something was done. And the medical re records were then retrieved. So we really compared two, no? the drug resistant as well as the non-drug resistant organisms. And later on, we also compared the clinically significant and the non-clinically significant isolates. So I crucial criteria are adult patients from January 1, 2015 to December 31, 2015. So again, respiratory and urinary samples for Capsella, urinary samples for E. coli, and blood and soft tissue for Staphylococcus aureus. Pediatric patients were excluded. So we did actually the data set of this study is quite extensive and we were able to uncover a lot of insights as well but I'm not going to present everything but just for the purposes of this symposium. So these are the following data sets that we um, retrieved. So the all morbid, for the morbidities and mortalities, they were assessed by a panel of IT specialists, mostly fellows, 
to determine whether the outcome is directly attributable to the infection or not. Of course, there is a limitation and caveat to this because not everything may be reflected in the charts. For the cost analysis, the study adopted a Bayer's perspective. So we did gross and micro costing. So the, for the micro costing, manumanyo po, no? especially for hospital expenses, since we were able to obtain important parameters like hospital day, duration of hospital stay, etc. The time frame for the cost, which is very important, is from the diagnosis or suspicion of infection up to discharge. The dates for the completion of the antibodies and discharge dates were also obtained. Even the dates of the laboratory results were also obtained. So the following costs were obtained and we subclassified them into these categories. Antibiotics only, non-antibiotics, diagnostics, medical doctors, nurses, other allied health professionals, even the how many times the doctors do rounds, the diagnostics, the procedures, the room rates, etc. Even the IV fluid and all the other ancillary consumables. So, uh, since most of the cases in government hospitals are charity cases, we did a number of assumptions. No? For charity cases, we, in one of our models, we use the cheapest award price in the pay wards as the cost. So the doctor's fees, especially for our charity cases, we estimated that to be based on the room rate for the charity, the cheapest ward room rate. And this is consistent with other uh, methodologies in other studies as well. So, how do we operationalize, how we standardize the, case, the cases and we try to evaluate whether the case is clinically significant or not? We use the CDC operational definitions. Of course, there are some limitations to this, but at this very moment, it is a retrospective study. This is the best that we have. So, for the results, no? uh, the data set is quite extensive, but I shall only share with you the four uh, analyses. So, we will be comparing First, resistant versus non-resistant organisms. Two, clinically significant versus non-clinically significant cases. Charity versus uh, pain cases. And actual cost versus the drug price reference index. Because in government hospitals, the Department of Health actually uh, has a number of recommendations of what price or ceiling price of drugs the hospitals should uh, uh, do no, for procurement purposes. Okay. Let's start, huh? So for the resistant versus non-resistant organisms, no? So this is just shows you the distribution of the isolates for the different hospitals. And as can be seen, majority really comes from uh, the Philippine General Hospital. No? And we have a KTI, the UST, and RMC. So based on the operational definitions, uh, the clinically significant cases no? for E. coli, is uh, for the ESBL drug resistant E. coli is 61%, for Klebschel is 70%, and Staphylococcus is 67%. And of course, as I mentioned before, we obtained the baseline characteristics and, and thank God for randomization, um, the majority of these characteristics were non significantly different between the resistant and the non resistant cases, except for the following. I mean, notable to, to note here is that for mortality, the mortality rates of those uh, with drug-resistant and non-drug-resistant organisms are not significantly different. No? Uh, this data might be skewed because the ARSP hospitals are tertiary hospitals and the mortality rates attributable to other diseases apart from infections are, you know, um, are severe since they are in uh, tertiary hospitals. Again, all of these uh, even the comorbidities are quite similar between the ESBL, I mean, between the resistant and the non drug resistant cases. So we're able to do some matching. So here, for the E. coli, again, it, ito yung different, no? Uh, just to orient you, uh, the red one is the drug resistant, that's ESBL, and the blue one is the non drug resistant. So for the total hospital days, the total hospital days of ESBL E. coli is significantly higher than that of the non-ESBL. And for the antibiotic duration also, for the ESBL organisms, higher, the antibiotic duration is longer. For Klebschella, we see a similar pattern. For drug-resistant Klebschella, longer hospital duration and longer antibiotic duration as well. 
But for the MRSA and MSSA, we didn't see the pattern, no? The MRSA and the MSSA, in terms of antibiotic duration in hospital days, are, are not significantly different. Now, let's not go to the, to the meat of the presentation in terms of cost. Again, to, to orient you, the red one here is the ESBL, and the blue one is the non-ESBL. No? So, uh, as we can see here, we actually divided the, the bar graph according to the subcategories. And this graph just tells us that the mean total cost for each case of ESBL E. coli was significantly greater than non-ESBL. So, if you know, per case, the mean is 117,677 for E. coli. No? And the estimated difference with the non-ESBL is around 29,297. For both groups consistent, the top three sources of the cost were health human resources, uh, procedures, and the root cost. For Klebsiella, again, we see a similar pattern. Uh, those with drug resistant, the red one, has significantly higher costs with a mean of uh, 182,400. And comparing that with the blue one, the non-ESBL, the difference is around 70, 72,300. Again, the pattern of health human resource, procedures, and room costs remain to be the major determinants for the cost. And for the staphylococcus, although this graph may show that there is a higher cost for the MRSA, this is not significantly different. Again, the cost is actually surmountable. It's 121,937 for MRSA. So we did the multivariate analysis for the E. coli uh, population and tried to determine what truly what, what the independent risk factors are, what, the, what are the independent predictors for the total cost. And what we um, uncovered is total hospital state, whether the organism is resistant or not in the age, are the independent predictors. And for the Krebsella, again, hospital state, the presence of hypertension, resistant or not, and diabetes are important independent predictors. For staphylococcus, hospital stay, age, and clinically significant cases. As we can see here, a hospital stay and whether the organism is resistant or not are independent uh, predictors for the cost in, in treatment. Now let's now go to the second sub-analysis, which is the non-clinically significant versus the clinically significant cases. And for everyone in the room, um, this is quite significant because this highlights the role of infectious disease practitioners and the role of antimicrobial surveillance and especially of antibiotic restriction programs. Because as you can see here, non-clinically significant cases are also being treated. Okay. So, now for the comparison, as we can see here, you know, let's go with the that in terms of baseline characteristics, the, this one here is the ESBL, the red one, and this here is the non-ESBL. Uh, this shows, this tells us that the clinically significant cases were significantly older from the green graph than those who are not clinically significant. And more, also more of the clinically significant the concomitant kidney diseases, no? Okay. Now, for the Staphylococcus aureus, I mean for the E. coli, the total cost for clinically significant, okay, let's turn it to a little bit, no? We'll now go here, Muna, in the, the red one is always the, the resistant, it's the E. coli ESBL. And this one here is the not clinically significant, and here is the clinically significant. Now, as we can see, we not sharp because the cost is higher for the clinically significant compared to the non clinically significant. The total is 131,437. But still, this is quite interesting because, again, the cost for the non clinically significant cases is also quite high. So, for the Klebsiella, we see the same pattern. Clinically significant is also significantly higher in terms of cost. Okay? So, for clinically significant cases, they have a statistically higher cost than non clinically significant cases for ESBL, E. coli, and MSSA. Let's go to charity versus pay. So what we did here, especially for hospitals like the Philippine General Hospital and KTI or USD, 
uh, it's a mix, you know, there are cases that are um, charity as well as pay. So we did a sub-analysis wherein we grouped together all the charity cases of all the different hospitals and also the, the pay hospitals. And this is what we uncovered. No? In terms of baseline characteristics, the pay, uh, the graph shows that the baseline characteristics that were specifically different between charity and, and pay. No? Just to orient you, the purple one is the pay, and the blue one is the, the charity. For E. coli, pay cases were significantly older than charity cases. And the pay cases also had significantly more cases with hypertension and diabetes. We saw the same pattern for Klebsiella. Those who are in pay were older as well as have other comorbidities. As well as in Staphylococcus, and age and diabetes uh, are higher in the pay section than in the charity cases. Now let's go to the cost. Let's go first with the E. coli, okay? For the E. coli isolates, the mean total cost for each case of ESBL and non-ESBL were significantly higher than the pay, obviously, right? This is the, the blue one here. And the mean total cost for ESBL charity, the red ones, and pay were also significantly higher than that, the non-ESBL. So, obviously, those in the pay actually pay more. The pattern is the same when we they took a look at the Klebsiella pneumonia cases as well as, as in the Staphylococcus aureus cases. So those in the pay actually pay more. Okay. Now, what if we implement the drug price reference index in terms of, for the antibiotics, you know, in terms of uh, trying to see whether it really does, whether it reduces the cost or not. And this is what we uncovered. For the E. coli, the red one again is a resistance for the ESBL. And if we do implement the DPRI, it led to a significant decrease in the cost for, for in managing drug resistant E. coli. But the pattern wasn't seen in the non ESBL E. coli. For Klebsiella, regardless whether it is ESBL or non ESBL, implementing the DPRI significantly reduces the cost. And it's staphylococcus, whether it's MSSA or MRSA, it also decreases the cost uh, when using the DPRI. So in conclusion, clinically significant infections prevalence, E. coli ESBL 61%, the non-ESBL 58%, Klebsiella ESBL 70%, and non-ESBL 68%, staphylococcus resistant, MRSA 67%, and MSSA 73%. I think it also, it, um, it's also an eye opener for us because um, despite the fact that uh, it's very important that we perhaps also document whether these cases are not clinically significant or not. Antibiotic duration in hospital stay are significantly higher for drug resistant organisms for both E. coli and Klebsiella compared to non ESBL organisms. And the mean total cost per case no, are the following for the ES. BLE coli is 170,677. For Klebsiella, 182,407. And for MRSA, 121,937. With the following difference when compared with the non uh, drug resistant microorganisms. So, as we can see here, the cost for treatment of drug resistant organis organisms is truly high. And this only highlights further the importance of investing in infection control in our hospitals. Thank you. Thank you so much, for Dr. Lim, for, uh, for the interest of time. I think uh, we cannot answer any questions, but you may uh, approach Dr. Lim. Actually, this is a very good paper, and it, it is a research opportunity for residents and fellows to do also the same paper from regional sentinel sites. So our next speaker is we welcome Dr. Hetson. Good morning. Let me just air my slides. All right. 
Alright, so um, I was the original intent of this symposium, um, young three speakers, was to really look at the effect of AMR and AMS. So we started talking about uh, money, you know, numbers. Uh, but there was supposed to be a, a topic on diagnostics, as you will see in your program, but we had to make a switch at the last minute. My talk uh, was originally entitled Novel Delivery Systems, but the intent of, that, of the talk really is on new antibiotics. So, so what's coming to the Philippines? Uh, something that uh, the antibiotics that are already in use in uh, Western countries. No? So these are my disclosures. And then this is my, these are my objectives. So I'd like to talk about uh, new antibiotics in the pipeline, including each antibiotic's unique antimicrobial coverage profile. What I would like you to think of is in terms of, so given a new antibiotic, which patients can I use them on? And then to briefly explain the possible effects of the new antibiotics on antimicrobial resistance. All right, I'd like to start off with a case. This is, we have a, we're presented with a 70-year-old gentleman with COPD chronic bronchitis and chronic kidney disease. He was discharged from the hospital about a week ago after treatment for pneumonia. He received meropenem for 10 days. Um, he has had recurrent admissions for pneumonia and bronchitis in the past and now presents with three days of fever, worsening cough, and sputum production. He has some comorbidities, medical comorbidities, and he presents to you in the emergency department febrile, hypotensive, and with bilateral crackles. And then you get the sputum gram stain. Um, it is gram negative bacilli. We don't have an automated uh, polling system, but I'd just like a show of hands. So what empiric regimen for this patient, what empiric regimen will you start the patient on? Um, who says piperacillin tazobactam? Anyone? No? Okay. Imipenem. Will anyone start this patient on imipenem? All right. Polymixin plus meropenem for empiric therapy. Hola? Hola? What about ceftolazine tazobactam? Hola? No participants talaga. <laughs> Okay, let's do it again. Empiric regimen. Uh, wait, um, sino dito ang um, uh, physicians? Can I at least have a show of hands of the physicians? Okay. Meron tayong 70-year-old na elderly with multiple comorbidities, multiple exposures to antibiotics. The question is, for this case, na may bagong pneumonia, what will you start the patient on? At least for the physicians, I'd really like you to answer. Piptazo. Sina magbibigay ng piptazo? Empiric. I see a couple of hands. Uh, okay. Inipenem. Alright. Thank you, Bob, for participating. Polymixin B plus meropenem. So combination therapy. Uh, I see some hands. Thank you. And then ceftolozane tazobactam. Okay. All right, thank you very much for your participation. There is a uh, spread out. No? There's, there's no one predominant answer. All right, I'd like to start off by talking about uh, the, the bugs that we really need to be concerned about. Okay? So, merong CDC list, merong WHO list, but the message is the same. These bugs are bad. Okay? For the CDC, they have an urgent threat level, and that's the carbapenem resistant enterobacteriaceae. And then meron silang slightly lower threat level, yung serious. We have ESBL enterobacteriaceae, multidrug resistant acinetobacter, and multidrug resistant pseudomonas aeruginosa. Brian has already showed you the cost of taking care of a patient with ESBL enterobacteriaceae and uh, staph aureus. Uh, so we know that there really is a huge difference in terms of cost. So WHO, it's about the same. Critical ang tawag ng WHO, critical priority level, but it's really CREs, crabs, carbapenem resistant acinetobacter, and carbapenem resistant pseudomonas aeruginosa. We also need to know about pathogens called escape. 
because these frequently are the ones that uh, carry multi-drug resistant genes. Uh, so Enterococcus phasium, Staph aureus, Clebnumo, Acinetobacter pseudomonas, and the Enterobacter species. So in our minds, no, as physicians, or siguro for the nurses here, you see your physicians, parang meron silang hierarchy of antibiotics. No? For the wild type susceptible gram-negative bacteria, you can use your broad spectrum antibiotics such as an ampicillin. No? Very simple. But once the, once the bacteria becomes uh, beta-lactamase producing, then you start to use a broader spectrum, maybe your beta-lactamase inhibitors, uh, coamoxiclab, amsobactam, piptazo, uh, and you can also use some of the cephalosporins. Okay? And then, so what Brian talked about, ESBLs. No? So when, when you have an ESBL producing organism, you really need to use carbapenems. And there was a recent study that came out called the Merino trial that somewhat settled the debate between uh, about whether you can use Hiptazo for ESPL and that trial showed that you shouldn't be using it for high bacterial burden diseases. And then if you encounter, if your culture report says that the bug is carbapenem resistant, what do you use? So the standard of care right now all over the world is uh, to use a polymyxin plus or minus a second antibiotic, usually a group 2 carbapenem. And then we also need to know about the five big carbapenemases, KPCs, uh, IMP or IMP, NDM, which is very notoriously drug resistant, the VIMS and OXA48. Okay? Um, when we think about bacteria that are carbapenem resistant, uh, it's not all carbapenemase that's causing it. It's the most frequent, but uh, I will show you a study later on that it's not always the case. So for carbapenem resistant gram negatives, you have carbapenemase producing, which will produce high level resistance to the carbapenems, uh, KPCs and the NDM, VIMS, and OXA48. But on the other hand, you can have non-carbapenemase producing bacteria. Uh, there could be changes in the efflux pumps or porin loss, etc. And these are usually, they, they usually occur together and there's usually low level resistance to the carbapenems. And this is the slide that I was talking about. There was a study done in 2017 by Dr. Shu where they looked at the rates of carbapenem resistant Acinetobacter and Enterobacteriaceae in South and Southeast Asia. The Philippines is at, is at around um, the, for, so for Acinetobacter, we have about 50 to 60 percent that's carbapenem resistant. And then for the Enterobacteriaceae on your right, the green, um, the, for E. coli, at least about 5 to 10 percent carbapenem resistance. And when they look at the kinds of enzymes that are causing the carbapenem resistance, they showed, we, they showed that we have a pretty high rate of IMP and NDM, which is pretty is very worrisome. The NDM in one study that I saw was about 33 percent in Metro Manila. All right, so let's now take a look at the new antibiotics. I'll be focusing on the gram-negative treatment in keeping with the um, first talk, uh, mostly ESBLs. So I'm going to talk about uh, five, five new drugs in detail. Uh, Ceftolosane tazobactam is the first drug, and this has already been released, and it's already uh, locally available. Um, it is a cephalosporin beta lactamase inhibitor combination, and it's been approved for intra-abdominal, complicated intra-abdominal and complicated urinary tract infections. Now, this drug is marketed as both an ESBL drug and an anti pseudomonal drug, but really, the niche of this drug is in pseudomonas. Why is that? Ceph so we know, we all know about tazobactam being a broad-spectrum beta-lactamase inhibitor, but ceftolozane is a new drug that has very, very good 
uh, anti pseudomonal coverage, and it will cover um, AMP-C in pseudomonas, OPRD loss, uh, efflux bumps, etc. So, so the only thing that it won't cover with pseudomonas is if, if it's a metallobatolactamase. So the, you, most of the multidrug resistant pseudomonas uh, bacteria will be targeted by uh, cephalosane tazobacter. So if I, I'd, I'd really like us for a take-home message to think cephalosane tazobacter, multidrug resistant pseudomonas. Okay? Now, ceftazidine avibactam is the second antibiotic I want to talk about. And this is not yet locally available, but I think I've heard rumors that it might come out this year, I'm hoping. Uh, it has also been approved for intra-abdominal and urinary tract complicated infections, but also, oh, but also for HAPVAP. Now, let, let me just go back to Seth Tolzain Tezo back then. There was a recent press release by the company who produces Toltezo, and they already have completed their pneumonia study, and it, it, it has been found, the drug has been found to be non-inferior to the comparator, which I think is meropenem. Uh, we are awaiting the details of that trial, and uh, I think this will really increase the utility of ceftolazine tazobactam because there's not a lot of pseudomonas in the abdomen, but you do get a lot of multidrug resistant pseudomonas in the lungs. Now, let's switch back to ceftazine avibactam. It has, it's approved for intraplanal and UTI, but also approved for pneumonias. Now, the special thing here uh, with uh, cas avi or ceftazine avibactam is that it covers certain uh, OXA, for, OXA enzymes. Um, so it is, so be, and that's because of avibactam. Um, ceftazidine, we all know about, that's a third generation anti pseudomonal antibiotic, but avibactam is the new, new thing here. It's a very broad spectrum beta lactamase inhibitor that will cover even OXA. That means that it will knock out most of the um, multi drug resistant uh, gram negative enterics with some coverage for uh, pseudomonas. Okay? The third Antibiotic is meropenem vaporbactam. It is a carbapenem plus a beta lactamase inhibitor. Now, uh, vaporbactam is another new anti uh, beta lactamase inhibitor. But in comparison with avibactam, vaporbactam was designed specifically for KPC. For uh, for KPC. So the the niche for this bug for this drug, uh, mer meropenem vaporbactam, is really for KPCs. Um, and not, not, not for uh, multidrug resistant pseudomonas so much. The other two antibiotics that have recently been approved uh, are erabocycline and plazomycin. Erabocycline is a tetracycline. Um, it's a novel synthetic tetracycline that's been approved for intra-abdominal infections. You notice that it's not approved for UTI and uh, has no approval yet for pneumonias. It's a tetracycline. So you know that there is very poor penetration in the urine. Um, and then plazomycin is a next generation aminoglycoside. So aminoglycoside resistance usually happens when they modify the, the, the molecule. Um, so plazomycin is, resi is, is resilient against that resistance mechanism. So it can cover um, the bacteria that produces modified aminoglycoside modifying enzymes. So it's approved for urinary tract infections, including pyelonephritis. Um, some key studies that I want to talk about, uh, ceftazidine avibactam, the, the main studies here are reprised and approved. Uh, these are the phase three trials. Um, it has been compared against meropenem, doripenem, best available therapy and meropenem and it has been found to be non-inferior for clinical cure rates across all the studies. The safety profiles also did not differ so much. Ceftolosine tazobactam, uh, the trials that uh, showed efficacy are called the ASPECT trials for UTI and for intra-abdominal infections. It has been compared to levofloxacin in UTI, I don't know 
exactly, you know, they should, could have picked something else, but I think that they went by guidelines here. And it's been found to be non-inferior for composite cure. Uh, interestingly, it's been, it's been compared to meropenem as well for intra-abdominal infections. And the trial on pneumonia also compared, I think, uh, ceftose and teso with meropenem. And it has been found to be non-inferior with similar safety profiles. Meropenem vapor backpam, this was uh, done by Dr. K and his group. And uh, this, these are the Tango 1 and Tango 2 trials compared to piperacillin tazobactam for UTI and uh, best available therapy for uh, Tango 2. You notice that in uh, UTI, in the first trial there were about 545 uh, patients. Um, the, the bugs that they included really were not so bad. It's in Tango 2 where they really picked out the carbapenem resistant enterobacteriaceae and then they did a pragmatic approach to the trial so that they did just best available therapy. And across the three diseases that they looked at, pneumonia, UTI, and intra-abdominal infections, the uh, meropenem vapor bactam did pretty well. Uh, numerically decreased day 28, all-cause mortality, uh, increased overall success, etc. Okay? Um, there is also uh, in the like in the safety profile, the last column on the right, um, when they compare it with the uh, best available therapy, there is a numerically uh, reduced failure nephrotoxicity and mortality nephrotoxicity of meropenem vapor back then versus best available therapy. This was a CRE. Uh, they, they, they looked at CRE, so they were comparing it mostly with uh, cholestin-based regimens. Ramcycline is uh, ignite trials compared with meropenem and ertapenem, non-inferior as well. And then plazomycin, um, the EPIC and the CARE trials. Um, I want to talk about the CARE trials. The CARE trials look at bloodstream infections, pneumonias, and carbapenem resistant enterobacteriaceae, and the comparator was a cholestin-based regimen, and there is reduced Day 28, all-cause mortality or significant complications. And also, they found that there is lower nephrotoxicity with, uh, I take it back, increased, some increase in the nephrotoxicity in plazomycin. This is, after all, uh, amino glycoside, so you do expect some uh, nephrotoxicity with this drug. Some other antibiotics uh, that are in the investigational phase, ongoing phase three, we have Astrianam avibactam. So we've heard of avibactam before, a very broad spectrum beta lactamase inhibitor combined with Astrianam. Why is that? Um, Astrianam is not hydrolyzed by metallo beta lactamases. So when you combine it with another uh, very broad spectrum BLI, then you have a really, really good drug. So we're waiting for um, reports about this drug. I'm pretty excited about cefiderocol. This is a no novel siderophore cephalosporin. Uh, has something to do with iron metabolism in the cell. It uses uh, iron entry. So it can penetrate the cell, and I read a review that says that the cell welcomes the antibiotic with open arms, and then it does its work inside the cell. So um, this one is a, one antibiotic to really look forward to. The third drug is imipenem relibactam. Relibactam has the same activity as imipactam. So um, let's also uh, see how it will perform. Now for 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 MDLs, there there is some there is some thought about using imipenem relibactam and astrionam uh, astrionam for oxa enzyme producing bacteria. All right, we all know that antimicrobial resistance is a natural phenomenon, right? This slide shows you uh, sort of a timeline of antibiotics. And penicillin was discovered in 1943, and a couple of years later, you find penicillin-resistant Staphylococcus aureus, and then methicillin-resistant Staphylococcus aureus. The point here is, 
you discover an antibiotic and in, a, in either a decade or in a couple of years, you will get resistant pathogens to that antibiotic. So we need to expect that the new at some point, these new antimicrobials will run into resistance problems as well. And that is why. So if the new antibiotics were addressed to were addressed or designed to address infections caused by increasingly resistant pathogens. So Brian talked about ESBLs, and for ESBL, we only we only need to use ertapenem uh, for these infections, and then for uh, carbapenem-resistant infections, we need to broaden and use stronger drugs. These drugs, I'm sure, are going to be very expensive. So the need for stronger drugs was because we were already dealing with resistant pathogens. So can you imagine that if we run into resistance problems with these new drugs, what our resistance profile will be like? If these antibiotics are not used properly, resistance to these new agents will become widespread. So what do we do? Um, we need to use our antimicrobials wisely. We need to know each drug's antimicrobial spectrum and use it to our advantage. For the physicians and the pharmacists, we need to know our PKPDs. We need to enhance efficacy of our drugs by using the PKPD profile. If it's a beta-lactam, consider using prolonged infusions of antibiotics, of, of, the, of, the, of the antibiotic. Um, and you notice that I've been talking a lot about OXA48, IMP, VIMS, and NTMs. And these are not really, this information is not readily available in the hospital, right? These are mostly uh, information that's available after a, a researcher has looked at some isolates. So I think that in the future, we really need to look at point of care molecular testing to better define the genetic makeup of our pathogens. And there are some tests that are already available that will give you very quickly whether the, the, the pseudomonas that you're looking at, uh, the, the report of your patient, has a porin loss or a carbapenemase uh, that's, that's uh, causing the carbapenem resistance. So I think that this is something that we should uh, invest on. And then finally, from a stewardship perspective, if you can escalate your antibiotic, please de-escalate them to the narrowest spectrum possible. The pipeline is no longer empty, but we really need to take care of these drugs. What you see on the left are the new gram-negative infection treatment, and on the right, which is equally exciting, but we don't have time to talk about them, are the antibiotics that cover gram-positive uh, infections, specifically MRSA. I'm particularly excited to, 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 to find out more about delafloxacin, which is a, a fluoroquinolone that has really, really good MRSA coverage. So, after we've talked about this, um, what empiric regimen will you start for the patient? Personally, I think I will go with a polymyxin B plus meropenem right now, because these antibiotics that uh, I talked about, um, are not yet here, but I could also consider cefalosane tazobactam, but based on my experience in my hospital, uh, there is some problem with resistance to cefalosane taso, and because this patient is hypotensive, then I might consider really using polymyxin. But that, that, that should be a caveat for everyone. Um, I don't think that we should start polymyxin B as empiric therapy left and right, because these are, at this time, our last defense, our last line antibiotics. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Carl and so So if you have other questions about the new antibiotics that we have, you may approach Dr. Henson here or later after the symposium. So now, um, maybe call on Dr. Janice Kawili to talk about the um, T 
TB notification. So this is a mandatory thing. Uh, DOH is going to be requiring everyone to report uh, their TB cases. So let's give a big hand to Dr. Kawin. Okay. May I ask who has, connect, who has internet connection? Because we will be trying the, uh, the website for TB notification. Show of hands? Okay. I think maybe more than 50%. So we're okay. So let's start. Uh, I'm presenting this uh, present this uh, slides in behalf of Dr. Elaine Mortera. So we actually had a forum session yesterday, but it was very late. And when we ended the the, the, the session, there were only ten people left in the room. Okay, there. So. This is actually uh, a project of the Department of Health and FHI 360. And the effort is really to notify more cases from the private sector. So I'm sure all of us are seeing TB patients, but who among us actually report our cases to the Department of Health? Okay, one, two, three. So we are actually not reporting the missing cases and that's what DOH aims and uh, that's why they're having this uh, project with FHI 360. We all know that not all um, providers are the same. We diagnose, we refer, we diagnose and treat but we don't report. Some of us may report through the local health centers but uh, as uh, uh, as uh, we see this morning, not all of us actually report. Okay, so where are the providers in the Philippines? You can see in this slide that around 35,000 are private physicians. And only around 16,000 actually work in public health institutions. Majority of our patients, however, are being seen in the public health facilities. But still 31.8% consult private doctors. So we've had several national TB prevalence surveys, 1997, 2007, and 2016. And you can see from this slide that we, the private practitioners still see a significant number of tuberculosis patients. So in 2016, around 31.8% of the patients seek uh, treatment from, private, uh, from a private physician. Okay, so this is a presentation during the last union meeting, and you can see that in the Philippines, around 70% of TB patients seek initial care from the private sector. And, of course, because we don't report the cases, and these are the missing cases. In the report, they mentioned that in the percent of global missing cases, the unreported cases in the Philippines is actually 7%. So that's a significant number of unreported cases. The notification rate from the private sector in the Philippines in 2017 is only 17%. So we don't report, majority of us don't re report our cases to the Department of Health. So what do we need to know? There is already a TB law, and it's already um, required that we report RT cases to the Department of Health. So there is now a mandatory TB notification and it requires all health care providers and facilities, both public and private, to report to the DOH every case of TB they see and using the processes that are uh, 
recommended by the Department of Health. Okay? So what's the legal basis? There's actually a TB law. It was signed into a law in 2016 by former President Aquino. And it requires that all public and private practitioners, as, as I mentioned earlier, report TB cases to the Department of Health. There's already a published implementing rules and regulations, and I think you can actually download this from the DOH website. And the process and the procedures for reporting are now being uh, implemented. So um, we are actually the first society to be discussing this in the Philippines. So we had a meeting with FHI 360 and the Department of Health just this month. And uh, Peace Mead, uh, represented by our president, signed uh, the, the partnership. And our goal is to actually increase TB notification among the private facility. So why do we need to notify? It is, a, as, we, as I said and emphasized, TB is a notifiable disease and a major public health problem. And TB burden remains unabated in the last 10 years. And despite PPM, PPM is public-private partnership. In the past years, many are still unengaged. So uh, we, and that's the reason why we don't report our cases. So if we report our cases, then we will see uh, really the cases of TB in the Philippines. As we all know, uh, MDR TB is also a big problem in the country. And um, we think that the reason why we have increases case, increased cases of MDR-TB is because we don't treat patients properly, okay? And uh, by doing this notification, we will actually be able to monitor patients who are started on treatment and eventually have an outcome, okay? There. So we have this very nice, um, you know, uh, presentation of all information about TB in the country, but what's really important to remember is, you know, TB is still in the, uh, Philippines rather, is still in the top 10 of the high burden TB countries in the world. And we've not, never really improved our status in the past maybe 20 years. Okay, and the 2016 TB prevalence survey showed that we actually have a lot of, still have a lot of TB cases. Okay, um, so who are required? We are required, and uh, there are steps to follow, okay? We need to register uh, our cases, but we also uh, have to uh, go through the process that are recommended by the Department of Health. Currently, we can notify them through paper form. That's already existing. But as you know, it will be very difficult because we see a lot of patients in the clinic and it's very tedious for us to be actually filling out additional forms. Some of our clinics already have electronic medical records and having paper forms is not, you know, it's not something that we can do. So because of all these constraints, the FHI 360 and the Department of Health is trying to innovate how we, re we can report our cases to them. So this is the paper form, okay? And I'm sure if you see these forms, you will not fill them out, right? You, you have to register first, and then you have to, um, to notify your cases. And you have to notify DOH whether you initiated treatment or not, referred your patient to another provider for treatment, or the patient refused treatment. So if you do the paper form, it will be very um, tedious, okay? But it's important for us to also explain to our patient that we need to report his case because we already have the TB law. And they will, and some of your colleagues, and maybe even uh, we will question, uh, you know, what's, what's the, uh, how safe is our, pay, is our data with them? But uh, according to DOH and FHI 360, uh, this is covered by Data Privacy Act of 2012. Okay. Okay, so this is the TB notification form that you can actually get from DOH and fill out manually. And it will contain all this information. A lot of information if you do it manually. Okay.
Okay, so now we will try to go to the website. This is not yet live. It's still, uh, it will still be implemented hopefully by December, but we are trying to familiarize uh, our physicians regarding this website, okay? So that uh, when it's already ready to be used, then we can, we can use it, okay? So we'll try the... So, the system is called the Integrated TV Information System of the Department of Health. So, as I mentioned, here's a scenario one where we report to the, uh, to, where we report our patients by paper, or there's a point person in your hospital who will do the reporting for you. Like, we refer all our patients to a, a clinic and the clinic has uh, a point person, and the point person does the reporting for all the doctors in the hospital. So that's another scenario. And right now, there is a, we have the TB notification officers, or TBNO. So what they do is that they go to the hospitals, they go to the clinics of the doctors, they collect the data, and then they go to the RHU and report the cases. And there's, there's an encoder in the RHU that updates or uploads the data uh, to the Department of Health, okay? But we also have, uh, we, they have also this website that we can register, okay? And then, um, they have, it's actually easy to use, okay? So it's something like this. And then later on, uh, I, I will show you the, how, how we can test the, the website. Can you hear me? Okay. You type this. I T I S T E S T dot G Q and then slash V one underscore four and then slash and then mandatory notification. Slash underscore four. Four, four. Yeah. And it's four. Number four. <laughs> Can you do it? Okay, let's do it. I T I S T E S T dot GQ and then slash and then V1 underscore 4 underscore mandatory notification. Slash mandatory notification. N O P I F I C A P 
P-I-O-N. Okay, got it? Okay. Meron nang naka, ano, naka puta? Okay, enter. There, okay. So you see that? Okay. Now, this is just a test site, but this is how we will register. So it will, it will not really require a lot of uh, steps, and uh, they will actually provide us with a, a video on how to do it. Now you put, for your username, okay, you put there, test physician, okay, and then for password, you do, you put in one, two, three, four, five. Sira pala yung four ng people natin. So you have, you have the special. One, two, three, four, five. Okay? Nakapasok na kayo? Okay. Check people. Two, three, test physician. So, are you here already? Okay. See, you can actually register when you are able to save password. Uh, never gonna die. So, you can actually view your profile, but of course, they already have this profile for the test physician. But when you register, it will be your profile. And you can edit, you can change your password also. Okay? But what's really interesting are the TV notification. What's good with, uh, with this also is that you can actually track your TV patients. Because if you have paper charts, you will not be able to track your TV patients. You don't know how many TV patients you have. You don't know how many of your TV patients are actually going back to you. And at least with this, uh, with this uh, reporting system, you will know how many t TV patients you have and how many patients have not yet completed treatment or are defaulting treatment. Okay, so let's see. Once you have entered, so these, there are already two uh, entered cases. You can look at view there, and you will see the information of your patient. So this information was uh, will be also be it will also be viewed by DOH. So if you report it to them, of course they will know that you have this patient and you started treatment. Okay, and they will actually uh, check if the patient started treatment within two weeks of diagnosis. So if the patient has not yet been started on treatment within two weeks of diagnosis, then they will either get in touch with you or get in touch with the patient. It's not yet clear, you know, if they will actually get in touch with the patient or contact first the, the attendant. If you want to update the outcome, you can update like that. And then um, you, you, well, the date of start treatment is not yet here, but you can actually, let's say the patient started treatment and the patient was already cured, and then you can just put your, your, your date there, and then just save it, okay? And then it says successfully updated. And now you go back to your view profile again, or rather your TV notifications, and then um, you can see, uh, you can, and then it doesn't show here if your patient already completed treatment, no? Maybe we can tell them. Dapat nakalagay na doon completed treatment. Okay. If you want to add more cases, then you do it this way. And it's easy, you know? You can just put your last, the last name of your patient, the first name of your patient, the middle name, the date diagnosed, o natatawa si Carl. Madrid lang, di ba, Carl? Rather than paper. Kaya ng secretary, exactly. So you just tell your secretary what to do. So that's actually, you know, it, it was made to be, you know, to be an easy uh, uh, registry. Okay? And then, but then you have to put all the information. Because, uh, see, it's red. So it means that it's, in, it's uh, required to be, to be, Enter. They also need the address of your patient because they said that if the patient has not been started on treatment or there's no outcome yet, then they might get in touch with the patient. Okay? So, yun po. 
we will be asked to be to to report our patients and uh, I hope that when they go to your hospitals because that's what they intend to do go to your hospitals and clinics then uh, we cooperate with them with the Department of Health and F F FHI 360 so that we can actually have good data of the TB patients being seen by the private sector because they always say that you know that the private sector is not reporting that's the reason we cannot achieve you know our, our goal for TB but I think if we do report they can see that we actually treat our patients properly and we follow also the guidelines recommended by the National TB program and also the World Health Organization so thank you that's the end of my talk. to announce that after this is the, the lunch symposium by Pfizer so you can get your lunch and after 10 minutes so we will start the lunch symposium. Thank you. 